Hello you guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about a crazy case and it's unlike anything that I've ever covered before. I don't want to give you guys any information beforehand so that you guys can go in blind, so we're just going to get right into it. This story starts on May 5th, 1980, all the way in Lubbock, West Germany. Seven-year-old Anna Bachmeier started this Monday just like any other school day for her. She woke up, she got dressed, she ate breakfast, brushed her teeth. However, right before leaving for school, she ended up getting into an argument with her mom. And this argument would end up dominoing into a crazy, terrible, long series of events that would forever alter her and her mom Marianne's lives. Because of this argument, Anna ended up skipping school. She wanted to do this to kind of spite her mom and get back at her because she's seven years old. This is her little seven-year-old brain's way of getting back at her mom because she was angry. In hindsight, Anna's plan for the day doesn't really make much sense because she wanted to go meet a friend instead of going to school, but then wouldn't her friend be in school? I don't... It doesn't really make much sense, but she did leave her house with the idea in mind that she was going to go visit a friend and her mom was thinking she was going to school. It was right after Anna started the journey to her friend's house that her neighbor, Klaus Grabowski, comes outside to talk to Anna. And she wasn't feeling nervous or scared because she had talked to him before. And at this point, he wasn't like a stranger danger or creepy guy to Anna. She talked to him all the time. But this conversation was about to take a deadly turn. Claus offered to let Anna come to his house to play with his cats and what seven-year-old would say no to this? So obviously Anna's like, oh, I want to play with your cats and she ends up going to his house. Although law enforcement was very familiar with Claus, no ordinary person knew that Claus wasn't just a normal 35-year-old butcher, but was an evil man with an evil past. Seven years ago, he had gotten a probation sentence, meaning that he was let out of jail but had some restrictions, and this was because he strangled a six-year-old girl. Just a few years later, in 1976, he sexually molested two nine-year-old kids and instead of going to jail they offered him another option he was offered a chemical castration and this basically lowers the libido's hormones i had never heard of this up to this point i didn't even know that that was something that the police offered but apparently in germany at this time this was a really popular alternative to going to jail and it's actually still used in a few states in the u.s to date and some countries such as russia and south korea still use it as well so claus chose this option but two years later he ended up manipulating a doctor into giving him the reverse hormones that would undo this and he was back to his old tricks in no time. Once Anna went into his house, he held her alive for a few hours and then he likely molested her, though he denies it to this day, but come on, look at his past. Like, it makes sense. But anyway, finally after this, he ended up strangling her with a pair of his fiance's tights and he hid her body in his house. Once his fiance came home from work that day, for some reason, he instantly confessed that he had killed someone. She secretly contacted the police, and why he told her is unknown. Like, it's either he wanted to be caught, or he wanted to brag, or he was feeling the guilt of it, or maybe in his demented mind, this was a way for him and his fiancé to bond over something that he liked to do. When his fiancé was out contacting the police, he thought she was just running errands, he took this time to tie up Anna's body using his butcher skills, so she was hogtied, and he took her and stuffed her into a cardboard box. Just a little bit later, he took this box with Anna in it to a local canal and haphazardly tried to bury her. Once investigators were informed of this, they immediately went to Claus's house to arrest him, but Claus wasn't there and there was a note left in his place. The note was pleading to his fiance to not turn him in and that he would be waiting at a local bar for her. Police went to this bar and Claus was obviously arrested. Shortly after, Anna's body was indeed found in the canal, somewhat buried by dirt. When police had to inform Anna's mother about this terrible news, she was extremely distraught and just broke down in tears. 
She began isolating herself and held a lot of anger and resentment towards Claus for taking away the only daughter that she had. And Anna's mother, Marianne, had not had an easy life. She was a single mother and Anna was all that she had, but it wasn't just that. Her childhood had been anything but enjoyable. She had struggled through her whole life and now to be faced with this was just another burden to have to bear. Marianne was born on June 3rd, 1950 in Sarstedt, Niederstadchen, Germany. And from the time that she was a young girl, her home had been violent and tumultuous. Her father had actually previously been in the Waffen-SS, which was the military branch of the Nazis, and it was his group that was in charge of the mass shootings, the warfare, and guarding camps. So needless to say, Marianne's father was a very angry and violent man, and unfortunately, he couldn't just leave this side of him at work. He brought it home. He was very strict and religious in the household and drank a lot. When he wasn't at the bar, this alcoholism fueled a lot of aggression in the home. He finally ended up leaving her mom, which is ironic because it should be the other way around, but at this time it was kind of shunned upon for the woman to leave the man. But he ended up leaving and her mother remarried. Unfortunately, Marianne's stepfather was not any better than her father and if anything, he was worse. He beat Marianne and humiliated her and her mother showed no effort to hide her lack of love for Marianne and she blamed Marianne for any and all conflicts that happened in the home. At only 16 years old in 1966, Marianne became pregnant and with not ideal living situations and her being still in high school, she made the tough decision to give the baby up for adoption. Only two years later, after meeting her current boyfriend, she was pregnant again. In the beginning, she was actually leaning toward keeping this baby, but after being sexually assaulted at a disco, this was just the breaking point for her, and she ended up giving up this baby for adoption as well. In 1972, she had finally moved out from her troubling home, and she was getting on her feet, and she ended up getting a job at a pub restaurant type place. This was also in Lubbock and it was called Tipasa and it was there that she formed a relationship with the pub manager named Christian. At age 22, she was pregnant again with Christian's child and at this point she was in considerably better life circumstances with a job and she had an apartment right above the pub. The past two pregnancies had really taken a toll on Marianne. She was feeling a void in her heart and she felt that she was finally ready to love and raise a child. Anna was born on November 14th, 1972, and at first, Marianne was in the honeymoon phase of having a baby, but it soon wore off. Her relationship with Christian had dwindled to an end, and the struggles of being a single mother started to sink in. She had to go back to work shortly after Anna was born, and as Anna grew up, even from a very young age, she was expected to take care of herself. Anna spent many hours at the pub while her mom was working the bar, and often Marianne's work life blended together and she was spending more time at the pub than she was being a mother or doing anything else. She often stayed after her shifts to party and Anna was just left there kind of hanging out. Even though Marianne had struggled in life, she loved her daughter infinitely and after Anna was killed, she was justifiably broken and filled with anger. Once Claus got arrested, this was obviously one positive in the case because Anna's killer wasn't just roaming around. But shortly after he got arrested, he began telling a different narrative of what he said happened before he killed Anna. He said that he never intended to sexually assault Anna and that she was threatening him. And during the trials, which I'll talk about in a little bit, you will learn the full extent of this narrative. So the months kept passing as the trial was slowly coming up and Marianne's resentment and anger never faded. Finally though, on March 3rd, 1981, the trial started at Lubbock District Court. It had been over a year since Anna's murder. On the first day, it was revealed Claus's full extent of his account of what happened and he said that he hadn't willingly molested Anna and that she had actually tried to seduce him. 
After he gave in to her seductions, he said that she attempted to extort him for a few dollars and that she said if he didn't give her the money that she would tell her mom that he molested her. Claus says that he just feels like he was in a sticky situation and then he sees his fiance's tights and the idea forms and before he knows it, he's killed Anna. While Claus is saying all this, Marianne is sitting in the front row and hearing all of this from the man who murdered her daughter and is now trying to spread rumors did not go over well with her. This obviously felt like a personal attack on Marianne and the anger that she had been feeling since the day Anna was murdered turned into an all-consuming rage and take note because it was likely this statement that caused the dominoing of what transpired over the next few days to take place. On the second day of the trial, Dr. Volker Vom Ende, who had treated Claus for the reverse therapy, had to testify. You might have caught on earlier when I said that Claus manipulated the doctor into doing this reverse hormone treatment, and when the doctor took the stand, he said that Claus did not reveal his past sexual crimes that he had been arrested for, and that he instead stated that it was a personal choice because he was an exhibitionist, and he wanted to try and turn his life around. This doctor later got in some hot water with the media and with Anna's father, Christian, who actually ended up suing the doctor later on for not doing his due diligence of checking Claus's past criminal history before going through with it. The, the doctor did none of this and just relied on his opinion and feeling that the man was trustworthy and wanted to start fresh. It makes me really wonder if, if the doctor had been more diligent on this and Claus would have never gotten this reverse hormone treatment, would he have done what he did to Anna? We will never know, but it's just something that I thought about. The scene of the crime was also described on the second day and how Anna was tied in the box and this fact caused some uproar in the courtroom because obviously it's terrible. On March 6th, 1989, the third day of the trial begins. It was rainy and gloomy and it really matched the mood of the courtroom. With the trial about to begin, Marianne walks in and is about to what we assume is sit down and find a seat, but when she's looking around, she is not looking for a seat, but for her target. As soon as she spots Klaus Grabowski, who is sitting down on the dock with his back to her, she starts strolling over towards him. At first, to the few people that were in the courtroom at this point, it looked like maybe Marianne was just going to, you know, give him a piece of her mind or make like a snide little comment, you know, which is rightfully so. But Marianne was on a different mission. And some might say that Claus had this coming for him and that he deserved every last bit of how his story ended. But other people talk about this moment and refer to the evil act that an unhinged woman committed and she should have just let justice take its course. Only yards away from Claus's back, Marianne stops. She reaches into her purse and pulls out a 22 caliber Beretta. Before anyone even knows what is happening, shots ring through the courtroom and Claus slumps over. Marianne had snuck a gun into the courtroom and shot seven times, six of which hit Claus, and he fell to the courtroom floor and died almost instantly. A few of the policemen in the court at this time say that right after Marianne shot him, she referred to him as pig. And amen to that. At the same time Marianne threw the gun to the side, a courtroom officer rushed over to detain her, and she willingly accepted her fate without any resistance. As she was being detained, she told the judge, I wanted to kill him. I wanted to shoot him in the face, but I shot him in the back, and I hope he's dead. When being examined by a doctor, Marianne was, was required to give a handwriting sample, and on this piece of paper, she wrote, I did it for you, Anna, and she had seven hearts for Anna's seven years of age. And it's so heartbreaking. Marianne was charged with murder, and as she found herself on trial, the media and public had a lot to say about what Marianne did. She had just done a ruthless act of being a vigilante, and people were torn. 
a lot of mothers all over the world were saying that she shouldn't be charged and what mother wouldn't do this like any mother would kill for a child. She was getting an overwhelming positive response from a good percent of the people in Germany. Many people gave her kudos for her bravery and having the guts to kill Claus and avenge her daughter because he deserved it. You could think of it as an eye for an eye or taking out the garbage of the world. Now Marianne had just done a favor to the people of Germany and there was one less evil person out there. But with all the support, there was obviously a percent of people who thought the complete opposite. They claimed that she was a cold-blooded killer and deserved to rot in jail and she murdered someone and now she could be considered just as bad as Claus and a murder is a murder, she has to pay. Police and the jury were also torn. They were divided and it was a hard case. I'm sure that many people wished that she could just get away with it because it is a different kind of justice, but justice all the same for her daughter. But at the same time, if they didn't charge her, it would be bending the law and a lot of people would probably take advantage of that and just start killing people all over the world. Thankfully, Marianne was able to get a really good defense team with money that she had gotten from selling her story to a magazine, and they were able to get her charges down from murder to manslaughter. When they finally convicted her, she was originally going to have to spend six years in jail, but she only ended up serving three and then got released on parole. In 1985, after getting released, Marianne remarried a German language teacher and together they moved to Lagos, Nigeria. Unfortunately, they did end up getting divorced in 1990 and Marianne moved around for a little bit, but she ended up settling back in Lubbock, Germany. Sadly, in 1996, after suffering from pancreatic cancer for some time, Marianne Bachmer died at only 46 years old, and she was buried next to her daughter, Anna. Even though she did get her version of justice by killing Claus, it makes me wonder if all the stress and sadness and jail really took a number on her and caused her to die so young. Anyways, that is the end of today's story. It was really crazy and really interesting when I first heard about it. I knew that I had to cover it because I love vigilantes and stories about taking it into your own hands and taking care of the evil people of the world, even though obviously it's against the law. I also understand why people can't just be doing this all the time and getting away with it because then more and more people would be killing and saying, well, I was just getting justice, they wronged me, and it would just be totally taken advantage of with the law bending more and more. I do like hearing stories about the few people that don't care about that and just want their version of justice. When this case was going on and the news was covering it so much, it had vastly different opinions of how it should be handled because some people just believe that she should get away with it and that they shouldn't charge her, but then some believed that murder is murder and she needs to pay and i think it worked out the best that it could at that point because she only served three years like that is hardly any time at all i'm wondering what other people think of how it should have been handled so leave your guys's opinions in the comments below i hope that you guys enjoyed this video don't forget to like and subscribe comment down below all that youtube stuff that you guys know how to do and i will see you guys in my next video bye guys